part three of this lesson, um, I will be much briefer um, and just seek to provide some general introductory uh, comments about Christ in the Old and New Testaments as well as the, Re the revelation of the Trinity as found in the Old and New Testament. Um, obviously the subject matter is too vast and would require a course and foundation in both biblical theology, biblical exegesis, and um, particular um, studies of specific scriptural books in order to do justice to this to um, the topic. It's just too large to undertake here, but I hope to just point out some general aspects and elements of biblical theology as, as especially um, approached by the, or within and according to the, the patristic and medieval model of theological methodology, emphasizing typology, recapitulation, and reductio or apocatastasis. So this lecture will be brief and um, also, um, also I will be, since I won't lecture at length on this topic, I will be posting notes um, containing um, commentary and scriptural references for the doctrine of the Trinity as foreshadowed in the Old Testament and made, ex and made explicit in the New, as well as um, I will be providing a couple of recommendations for those who are interested in pursuing it in Christology in terms of uh, biblical, theological, and historical studies on the person of Christ within uh, first century, century uh, Judaism. So now just for a, a few uh, brief observations. First of all, we must remember that although the revelation of the Trinity is implicit in the Old Testament, as well as uh, objectively present in creation, the human mind wasn't able to come to an adequate or clear knowledge of this reality and thus wasn't able to offer um, adequate and pure worship to God apart from the incarnation of Christ. And so in, in, a, in a real sense, um, through the application of typology and recapitulation, we find that even our notion of God is recapit recapitulated and organized in terms of our knowledge of Christ. And, and thus, Christ, through the divine maternity, that is, a maternity that is virginal and uh, immaculate, Christ reveals the Father, the very source of Scripture and revelation, in the Spirit. And so in Christ we find the revelation of the Father. He who sees me has seen the Father, and this is the knowledge of God, to know the Father and to know me. Um, and then in the Spirit, through Christ's charismatic gifts, which he then can communicate to his disciples, um, the revelation of the Trinity in and through Christ becomes clear. And so, you know, those are just some foundational initial observations to set the stage for how to appropriate our understanding and received interpretation of the scripture in terms of uh, an explicit Trinitarian theology. Any Trinitarian theology that we develop will ultimately be in and through our knowledge of Christ as both God and man and brought about in a Marian mode. So I'm not going to go through every Old Testament text and, and New Testament text revealing uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, nor can I, uh, as I've said before, um, provide a biblical theological account or even really um, provide a list of scriptural references um, articulating and revealing the nature and person of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's just uh, too much, and in fact the entirety of scripture is about both. It's about the Trinity and the economy centered upon and founded upon, uh, at least with respect to our knowledge of the Trinity founded upon the person on the person of Christ. But in some sense, um, the typological approach to scripture is 
manifest in approaching the question of Christology because um, the Trinity itself is depicted in type in the Old Testament Testament, for example, um, in the very words of creation as received by the, uh, the Church Fathers when God said, let us make man in our image. Now clearly, um, historical critical exegesis will uh, beg to differ and explain that in terms of different sources and different uh, cultural and religious backgrounds. But the fact is, is that there is a plurality that is spoken of in reference to God, even put in the very mouth of God. Uh, for example, as well, when Abraham meets uh, the three men at the Oaks of Mamre, um, there's also uh, a theo theophany that uh, hearkens to the Trinity. And then, of course, various psalms and um, and prophetic books speak of the Spirit of the Lord and uh, in distinction from um, God himself, a term usually appropriated, especially in the patristic literature and in the New Testament, to the fathers. So in the Old Testament, there are foreshadowings or adumbrations of the Trinity, but only through an understanding of um, Christ himself do these types of the Trinity become manifestly revealed in and through the revelation of relation of the hypostatic union, and thus, on the one hand, the consubstantiality of the Word with the Father, and on the other hand, the personal distinction between the Word and the Father, and then the sending of the Spirit. Um, so, the Old Testament contains a foreshadow foreshadowing of the revelation of the Trinity, and is made clear in the New Testament, especially as articulated and hammered out in the context of the early Christian heresy, such as Arianism, Eunomianism, um, the issue of the definition at Chalcedon of consubstantiality. All of these matters uh, bear upon our understanding both of Christ and his person, and also then by implication the nature of the Trinity as tripersonal. And I will be uh, attaching um, or uploading to Lesson 2 uh, some notes containing um, texts that both specify the various scriptural themes with respect to the Trinity and also provide uh, refer references to those scriptures themselves. Finally, then, in closing out the third part of Lesson 2, uh, we can say a few words about Christ. Um, and, of course, this is a very general biblical theological outline and certainly doesn't exhaust the contents of especially the New Testament, but, but also the entirety of the Old Testament in foreshadowing um, um, the momentous occasion of the Incarnation and all of the implications the Incarnation had for our redemption and um, our... Uh, deification and resurrection and and eternal life and glory. So the first thing, though, that in Christ there's <clears throat> an essentially uh, divine willed Marian mode. Mary is uh, essential to God's plan because God planned it that way. So thus, even in the first book of the scriptures, we find that it's through the woman that the serpent's head would be crushed and that it is the woman, woman who shares the same quality of enmity with respect to the serpent as does the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. So this is a clear foreshadowing of the incarnation and the redemptive and salvific work of our Lord Jesus Christ through and within a Marian mode in destroying the work of of the serpent and undoing the tangle of sin and the consequences of death. And of course, we can look now in, in you know, a biblical theological sense at the fourth chapter of Galatians, wherein Paul writes, in the fullness of time, the woman gave birth to a man born under the law so that, so that man might be freed from the consequences of both the law and sin. And so, and so finally, then, then um, this Marian mode bears upon the incarnation, 
first of all, the, the, the second person of the Trinity assuming a complete human nature, the resurrection, the resurrection consequent on Christ's redemptive life, life suffering and death, but this resurrection as the, the fullness of human existence in Christ, and then his glorious ascension, and of, of course the entirety of the New Testament, but especially the, uh, the Synoptic Gospels, um, articulate and recount those events. And then we clearly see in Christ, though, through this Marian mode, in his ascension, this ascension allowed for the descent then of his spirit in the economy. Um, as the spirit proceeds through the Son in, in the imminent trinity, so does the spirit proceed from the Son in the economy of salvation. Christ sends his spirit uh, in Acts chapter 2, thus fully instantiating uh, the nascent church and equipping the church for um, for carrying out in an adequate manner the mission Christ gave to the church in the persons of the apostle apostles at the end of uh, the book of Matthew. And then ultimately Pentecost, though, um, if it begins in the descent of the Holy Spirit, it is, is perfected in the mystical body of Christ and all of its members being rendered spotless like Mary Immaculate, in the transformation of each member of Christ in the body of Christ in order to be presented as a bride, as a spotless bride, by the spotless bridegroom to the Father at the end of all things. And then finally, this um, Pentecost act, this, this act or activity of the Spirit in the life of the church speaks to the consummation of Christ's work. First, in Christ on the cross, Christ completing his redemptive work and thus meriting and accomplishing our salvation in his life, but ultimately then being raised to newness of life in the resurrection and ascending, and ascending to, the right, to the right hand of the Father on high. And this, of course, this consummation sees its fulfillment in Christ's work on the cross, but ultimately in his resurrection and ascension, which is then signified or foreshadowed in, in the book of the Apocalypse in chapter 12 with the vision of the woman who is assumed into heaven and then the descent again at the end of all things in, in Apocalypse chapter 21 of the New Jerusalem with perfect symmetry and beauty and purity, um, which represents again the, the consummation or fulfillment of the work of Christ in his, and through his spirit throughout all ages and all times in his mystical body. And um, although we can't go 